So let's say we have a cubic crystal that consists of eight identical atoms. And as you can see, I'm not very good at drawing atoms that are absolutely identical. But let's say these are all atoms of iron. It really doesn't matter what element you choose for the purposes of this illustration. So those eight atoms are connected into a cube-like shape. And let's say we have, um, we'll, we'll count the positions. So we'll call this position one, two, three, and four, and then five, six, seven, and then for that fellow that's back here, we'll call that position number eight. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight different positions. So let's say the iron atoms are all labeled. They're kind of like billiard balls. We'll call one though A, B, C, another it's D, and then E, and then F, and then G, and H. So we've got eight iron atoms, and they're all labeled with different letters. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how many arrangements for this cube, uh, how many arrangements can we make uh, if we take those eight atoms and put them in this kind of cubic arrangement? Well, for that first slot, let's say we fill that first slot first, number one, we have ch a choice of eight. We can pick any of those. Let's say we choose the letter H. So let's get rid of that guy. That's now gone. We have a choice of eight. Now there are seven left. Let's say we choose C for the next one. We a choice of seven and we chose C. Right? So now C is gone. So we have six that are left to choose from. Let's say we choose the letter A. So how many are left? Um, one, two, three, four, five. We have five choices left. Let's say we choose the letter B. And as you can see, we can keep on going as we start filling in the letters. We have fewer and fewer choices for each slot. So let's say we put D over here and then F, and then E, and then G. So now we've used up all the letters, and we had these many choices for each, for each case. So this is one particular combination here, where we have uh, H in the one spot, and then C in the two spot, and then uh, A in the third spot, etc. right? So these are our slots, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So those are the different spots, the different places in the crystal. Uh, but we had a, a larger number of choices when we started and fewer as we went through. So how many different ways can we combine eight atoms into that cube? Well, it ends up that to get that number, we would simply take the product of all of these things. That's otherwise abbreviated as eight factorial and 8 factorial is equal to 40,320. So for this tiny little cube, there are 40,320 different configurations. That would be our value for omega in the uh, Boltzmann's Law formulation for calculating an entropy. And this is just, just one tiny little cube that would be uh, utterly microscopic, well, below microscopic. Uh, this would be very difficult uh, to image with anything but the most powerful scanning electron microscopes. So for something that is much larger, if you had a natural piece of halite that contains on the order of Avogadro's number 10 to the 23 molecules, then this number really explodes to just impossibly large values. So we have many, many different kinds of configurations. So what that means is that the total entropy in a system can be very, very large. Total, total entropy can be very large. So when we say that in a spontaneous reaction that entropy increases, it, it isn't so much a hard and fast law, but rather something that is highly probable. This is the change that came with Boltzmann's equation. He started looking at chemical reactions 
not as things that were driven by immutable laws that can never be violated, but rather by highly probable systems. So that the reason that heat would flow down temperature from high temperature to low temperature is not because heat cannot flow in the other direction, it can, but it's just extraordinarily unlikely because of the numbers of configurations that are possible uh, in, in these relative systems. So you can write that heat flow in a Boltzmann's law kind of formulation, and you'd be able to show that it's just, it, it's not necessarily impossible, but extraordinarily unlikely. I'm going to end here with just kind of a simple example of what entropy means from a Boltzmann's probability perspective. Let's say you've got a coffee cup. So here is a coffee cup that's sitting on some table in your home or office. So there's a coffee cup sitting on the table. So when I was a kid, I had a friend of mine who said that uh, he was sitting next to uh, his uh, nightstand and a cup moved from the table off to the table and it spilled on the floor. And it happened without any external force. Well, of course, I did not believe him. It doesn't make any sense that a coffee cup could move without any external force. Maybe there was an earthquake and he just didn't notice it. Uh, maybe he bumped the table or a cat moved by, who knows. Well, Boltzmann's law actually allows for another possibility. So if you think about all of the atoms that are in this coffee cup, it's going to be much larger than 10 to the 23 for any normal coffee cup. Right? There are going to be many, many atoms, many times Avogadro's numbers of atoms inside this cup. There are a total number of configurations in that cup that would be related to the vibrations. So if you look at the atoms that are in the cup, you can think of them as vibrating in various directions. There's a very small possibility that the atoms in the ceramic material that makes up this cup maybe half of them at some arbitrary point in time would all vibrate in a single direction. Now, that's extremely unlikely because they're all vibrating in random directions. But if they were to all vibrate, or not even all of them, if just half of them, or maybe a third of them, were to vibrate in one direction at the same time, then that cup could actually move without any external force acting on it. It's an amazing result, and it's also an incredibly unlikely result. So if anybody tells you that coffee cups are sliding around their tables without any external force, uh, you can't necessarily say that it's utterly impossible, but you could say that it's so improbable that it is effectively impossible. So that's one of the strange but sort of interesting aspects of entropy. So that concludes our, our brief summary in this section.